the BC Resources Coalition, proudly sponsoring the 2020 Candidates Forum, preserving our jobs, our future, our environment. Learn more at the bcrc.ca. The 2020 Candidates Forum on CKPG is presented by the Prince George Chamber of Commerce. Engage, connect, enhance. Find out what the Chamber can do for you. Hello and thank you for joining us. My name is Jesse McGowan. I'm with CKPG News and you are tuned in to the 2020 All Candidates Forum ahead of October 24th's provincial election. Now to my left we have the candidates in the Prince George Mackenzie riding for the upcoming election. You will get to meet them in a few minutes. First though, a couple of important details. We would like to acknowledge that we are, that we are on the traditional territory of the Clay Tanay First Nation. We're here in Prince George inside Theatre Northwest, but it looks a little bit different this year due to COVID-19. There's no one in the audience, just us, the candidates and the crew that's working on this forum. So we thank you for tuning in at home to get educated on our candidates and their platforms. The way that tonight will work is that we will give each candidate a two minute opening statement and subsequent one minute timeframes to answer several questions with issues that are pertinent to the North. Now, of course, um, we will also close with a two minute question or a two minute closing statement. Uh, our order for each candidate has been randomly assigned and you will see them in just a moment. We will give them a chance to introduce themselves now as we move into our opening statements. So we will start with Christian Heritage Party candidate Dee Krantz. Good evening. My name is Dee Krantz and uh, I represent the Christian Heritage Party of British Columbia in the Prince George Mackenzie riding. I'm a wife. I'm a mother of four grown children and uh, grandmother of six. I have been a registered nurse for 20 years at the Prince George Hospital and I was a businesswoman for 15 years. I am not a politician, but I felt compelled to put my name forward because of my deep concerns of what I see happening. The Christian Heritage Party is uh, first and foremost um, we want to restart the economy. We want free speech, and we see that free speech is under huge attack. We find that without free speech, we have no democracy. Massive amount of censoring, and that has to stop if we want to contain and keep our democracy. Uh, we believe in parental rights. We believe parental rights supersede any of the uh, state rights. And uh, we believe in school vouchers, and what I mean by that is that uh, parents should be allowed to either send their children to school or they should uh, be able to homeschool them. It's their right as a parent. We believe in conscience um, uh, rights for doctors or for people that um, uh, are required or the state tries to make them do something against their conscience. We don't believe that that should be allowed. We believe in vaccination choice. If you want one, fine. If you don't, there should be no recriminations or force. We believe in food security and that uh, food should be labeled if there's GMOs. We, uh, we believe in free enterprise. Um, we believe in defunding the uh, gender reassignment. Um, if they want that surgery, it should be paid on their own and not through public funds. We wanna keep the US border open. And again, I would really like to say that um, if you want change, I think I'm your candidate. Well, I don't think, I know I'm your candidate. Thank you. We'll now move on to Liberal candidate, Mike Morris. Well, thank you. Uh, um, I've been <clears throat> I've been around uh, this area most of my life, born in Quinell, and uh, I've had the the good fortune to visit every community, every town, every city, every village, every First Nations community in the northern 75 percent. And I and through that I understand the regional importance of Prince George in this entire area, from an economic and also from a social uh, democratic uh, or uh, um, perspective. Uh, very concerned over the SNAP election being called. Uh, we're in the middle of a provincial health emergency with COVID. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of, uh, of factors that are involved there with, uh, with public safety that are uh, of great concern. And uh, there was no good reason for this. Uh, the government was secure in its seat. Uh, they had a very good working arrangement with the Green Party. And all three parties that were involved in the legislature in British Columbia had all committed to working together to make sure things work right through until the scheduled legislative uh, um, um, 
uh, election in October 2021. So uh, no reason for this election at all. But having said that, let's get at it. Uh, we are prepared to uh, uh, introduce a, uh, a massive agenda in infrastructure spending. Uh, we want to support small business. If nobody's working, we've got a number of people that have uh, um, that are off work right across the province, right across the country. Small business is suffering significantly. Uh, so with our elimination of the PST for a year, reduction uh, to 3% thereafter, uh, we feel that's going to significantly encourage small business to stay on and keep their people employed. We're going to reduce and eliminate the uh, small business uh, income tax. Uh, just to try and kickstart our economy along with a massive $30 billion over three year infrastructure spending program. So hang on to your hats. I think uh, we got lots to do in this province to get it up and running again. All right, thank you. We'll now move to Green Party candidate, Catherine Kendall. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me, I'm honored. Um, my name is Catherine Kendall and I'm here on behalf of the Prince, <laughs> the Prince George Mackenzie riding um, Green Party of BC. Um, I'd like to share that I have um, 20 years of experience in community development. I've done two years of that work um, working for the Solicitor General doing Aboriginal gang prevention. I've had some experience in the north working with a chemist in environmental health, taking hair samples of First Nations people in one particular community in Blueberry River where there were sour gas well leaks and individuals were um, contaminated by those sour gas well leaks. I've done bioregional mapping in the area of North Nach in the Nachaco River area in the Vanderhoof bioregion, um, where I interviewed um, numerous people to um, find out over the last 50 years how the environment's been impacted by the Kenny Dam, which um, powers the smelter in Kitimat for aluminum. Um, the work that I'm doing to date now is I'm the executive director of the Kanat Youth Centre Society. That work stemmed from the Aboriginal youth work that I did in gang prevention. I now provide prevention-based programs for high-risk youth so that those youth will become better citizens in our community. So they run from their school place into our facility where we feed them well, give them great healthy snacks, give them opportunities to actually play safe and not have to um, hang out on the streets. Um, this is very important work and I believe that um, the work that nonprofits do is very underrepresented in our communities and across the province. Um, these are the people that are doing amazing work with amazing community members at uh, very low cost. And I believe that um, with the work that I've done in community development, um, my focus is really making sure that we're filling the gaps and making sure that the people that are falling through the cracks are served and we're meeting those community members um, where they're at, whether it be in mental health or high-risk youth, gang prevention, or in our senior centres. Thank you. All right, and finally, we'll go to BC NDP candidate, Joan Atkinson. Good evening. My name is Joan Atkinson, and I am the NDP candidate for Prince George Mackenzie. I'm a very proud Northerner, and I look forward to the opportunity of representing the North and bringing a strong voice to Victoria. I have lived in Mackenzie since 1997, and uh, moved there following my husband for work. I have been the uh, mayor of Mackenzie since the election of 28, in 2018. Prior to that, I was deputy mayor and councillor before that. I, I strongly feel that the connections I've made and the working relationships I have and the understanding of the issues that are important to our region, um, I have that experience. I've also been a government employee my entire working career, having worked for the provinces of Ontario, Manitoba, the federal government, and the province of British Columbia. I've worked for the Ministry of Forests, Environment, Attorney General, and Service BC. So I have a solid understanding of the obstacles and the challenges that um, everyday residents have accessing government programs. But I also fully recognize the challenges that government employees have delivering um, those, those programs. I, I did lose my job back in 2001 when Gordon Campbell slashed the BC uh, Public Service and I was lucky enough to get back in and, and um, have been a happy government employee my entire life. My husband and I have raised two sons. They're both grown now and both of them are uh, involved in the forest industry. So I, I really encourage everyone to get out and vote. It's your right. And I'm asking you to please vote for Joan Atkinson on October 24th. 
All right, thank you all. We will jump now into our question period. Uh, question one starts with Ms. Kranz. Um, let's start with the election call itself. September 21st, 2020, BC's Premier calls a snap election during the fight against COVID-19. In your opinion, was this early call to an election necessary and why? No, I think that uh, Premier Horgan was um, attempting to uh, kind of take advantage of the uh, shutdown of the economy and the people are being uh, segregated and uh, you can't get out and really campaign like you could in the past. Um, so I think he was doing, he was doing it, he had, uh, um, I guess, political reasons to do that. So I don't think it was a necessarily a, a very good thing. All right, we'll move on to Mr. Morris. Yeah, no, as I said in my opening statement, uh, it was uh, purely a, a political opportunity for uh, the Premier to call the election. There was no valid reason to hold the election at this particular time. Uh, the, the, um, the, the statute uh, required that an election take place in October of 2021. And of course, that was legislation brought in by the NDP government, by John Horgan and his, and his government. Uh, and they violated that themselves. So. Uh, there was there, like I said, uh, with COVID-19, we're in the middle of a provincial health emergency. Uh, people are very concerned over the spread of COVID-19 and their own personal health, the health of their families. And I think that Horgan jeopardized or is jeopardizing the health of everybody in this province by carrying on with this, uh, this election at this particular time. So there's no reason for it. Every, every, it was a stable government at the time. The Greens were cooperating. We were cooperating. There's no need for it. All right, Ms. Kendall. I'd like to share that um, Premier John Horgan um, took a very powerful position to call this type of election at this time um, at the detriment of our community members across the province. Um, I, you know, there are many of us that were stepping up to the plate for next year's election with preparation and time to actually um, mobilize community members and what we're seeing on the street is that people are um, not wanting to engage. Um, they feel um, robbed of an opportunity to um, vote next year as opposed to in a rush during a crisis. Um, the barriers that exist because of COVID are astronomical. I feel that it's uh, quite unacceptable that we're here at this place. And finally, Ms. Atkinson. Thank you. I fully support Premier Horgan's decision to call this election. There are no guarantees um, that this will be gone by this time next year. We certainly did not anticipate in March when this all blew up that we would be where we are right now. We are making little progress. Um, a lot of parts of the country are all, all, almost in worse shape than we were six months ago. I think moving forward, out of this um, COVID and during this COVID pandemic, we need, a, we need strong leadership and we need a government that's going to move things forward. I have full confidence in Election BC that they will conduct things so that we are all safe. We are sending children to school. Voters can go to the, uh, to the uh, polling stations. All right, we'll now move on to our questions surrounding economic recovery. Uh, Mr. Morris, this will start with you this time. 98% of business in BC is small to medium sized. Surveys have indicated that more than 25% will not return post pandemic. What would your government do to assist businesses and the economy through the recovery process? Yeah, as we've already announced a few things there. Elimination of the PST for a year um, is since it's a um, immediate effect on all British Columbians, but particularly on small business. Uh, and then a reduction to 3% thereafter. So it puts a little bit more uh, money into the pockets of small business. Uh, it's a time that they can uh, re renew a lot of their equipment uh, needs and whatnot. Um, we've also eliminated the uh, income tax on small business, 2% income tax. And that also is going to, uh, you know, every little bit helps. So it'll help the uh, industry themselves uh, have a little bit more money to invest, uh, keep their companies open and keep British Columbians employed. And that, that's a big part. Uh, you know, we need to keep every British Columbian employed that we can uh, so that we can spur our economy forward and uh, uh, support the the uh, restaurants and all the other industries that uh, the service industries. Ms. Kendall. 
Um, definitely funding will be supplied to our small and medium businesses that um, exist today that are having issues as well as those that are um, falling by the wayside. Um, there are a number, other, a number of other incentives that will be provided including pushing for a four-day work week. Um, the health of our uh, health and well-being of our community members is front and foremost. So pushing for a four-day work week so we can spend more time with family and more time in our lovely and beautiful environment. Um, and making sure that people have that opportunity to enjoy their life as opposed to pushing to make that extra dollar and making sure that those things are supported. Um, I think those things are important. Okay, on to Ms. Atkinson. Thank you. The BCNDP recently announced funding for post-pandemic um, infrastructure to move the economy forward. Um, this is going to be available to communities, to businesses, and it will help gap, fill that gap um, from where businesses are now, especially small business, to where they want to be in 12 to 18 months because this pandemic is not going to go away anytime soon as much as we'd like to. I think we all appreciate the contributions that small business make to us. I'm certainly not in favor of tax cuts because right now um, we need that money to fund services that we're using to take care of our most vulnerable and that has to be a priority. And Ms. Krantz. Um, well, I take a different approach because um, the World Health Organization has just said that they are uh, for not locking down countries that they found that this is not the way best way. They flip-flopped many times on what they should be doing. So I'm for ending the lockdown, I'm for pipelines, I'm for forestry and getting the economy going. And um, we need to do an investigation as to the seriousness of this. There's no scientific basis for um, what has is, what is transpired and, and we need to hold this government accountable. Thank you. All right, now to a resource question. Ms. Kendall, this one will be coming to you first. Global economists have identified our resource sectors as the pathway to economic recovery. If elected, how will your party support our forestry industry? Um, the first priority would be making sure that we're not um, shipping raw logs out of the province um, and accentuating the value added sector so that we're really pushing for our high school students and students going into colleges to have the opportunity to learn crafts such as carpentry and various other related types of um, engineering with wood so that we were able to actually keep those raw logs in the province and um, extend the value. Um, at this point, when we're creating um, fiber farms across the farm, sorry, across the province, we are um, devastating landscapes, devastating um, ecosystems, and we really need to take the time to actually look after the ecosystems. So making sure our raw logs aren't being shipped out of the province. Ms. Atkinson. Thank you. The NDP have already taken the steps to revitalize the forest industry. Last April, April 2019, Premier Horgan wrote to every CEO in this province of a large forestry company, uh, encouraging them to form area timber supply coalitions so that all the stakeholders could come together, figure out what's not working and come up with solutions. I'm the co-chair of the Mackenzie Timber Supply Area Coalition. We had our first meeting in uh, January of 2020 with over 50 participants, First Nations, labor unions, big business, government. Since that time, we've had about 30 meetings and we are ready to bring recommendations to government that industry leaders say will be uh, game changers in the industry. On to Ms. Kranz. Um, the Christian Heritage Party um, believes in um, forestry and we believe that uh, increasing the um, uh, export tax on lumber uh, so that uh, we're not just exporting raw wood, um, would, uh, that we would actually have value added products go to market as opposed to shipping everything overseas and then rebuying the finished products back. We believe in supporting the forestry and, and we believe that uh, British Columbia has done a very good job in keeping the uh, ecology of the land in a good condition. So we are for forestry. 
And Mr. Morris. Yeah, we've already started, or, you know, in our statement about uh, eliminating the PST. Uh, that will provide some uh, relief for force companies and, of course, eliminating the small business tax or income tax of 2%. We're also going to introduce a market-based stumpage system. Uh, the one that we have right now the, has such a lag to it that it's very difficult for forest companies to uh, forecast what they will be doing and how they're going to be doing it a year from, uh, from now. And uh, so that, that needs to be addressed. Uh, forestry is going to change significantly right across the province because of the lack of fiber and, and access to fiber. And uh, so forestry uh, mills will be downsizing. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different things that need to be considered uh, as we move forward through that. But I think the incentives that we see with the uh, reduction in the PST and the small business tax, I, I think will be a great incentive for forestry along with a market-based uh, stumpage system. All right, next we deal with a healthcare related question. In some of BC's largest ridings, access to healthcare becomes incredibly important. How will your party meet the demands of healthcare delivery in the North? Uh, for question four, we go to Ms. Atkinson first. Thank you. Our, our current government has uh, certainly shown leadership in this, and um, I'll, I'll talk about a few specific instances. So certainly the urgent primary care centers that have been set up across the province, and Prince George has one of those that I hear is working very well. The announcement of another medical school in this province is going to go a long way in addressing the shortage of healthcare professionals in the province. Uh, we, we all know people who have tried to get into medical school and that is a huge challenge. That is one of the biggest challenges to actually get a spot. So certainly that is going to, to help. And of course, the additional 7,000 healthcare workers that are currently being hired will go a long way to address healthcare issues. Ms. Kranz? Um, I think that um, um, having um, nurse practitioners in the smaller areas um, facil facilitates the, um, uh, instead of having a doctor there, the nurse practitioner can actually uh, do most of the same type of work. Um, at a fraction of the cost. We're $75 billion in debt. And so we don't have all these, like a ton of money to do everything that we'd like to do. I think we need to uh, start to streamline and I think we need to push health. We need to promote health as opposed to uh, uh, push pharmaceuticals. I think um, if we have a healthier um, uh, clientele, healthier patients, we won't need the hospitalizations. I'm more for um, keeping people in their homes as long as possible. Mr. Morris? Yeah, no, thank you for that. Uh, so we will be going ahead and building a new uh, Prince George Hospital uh, it, and we'll be ensuring that it's got cardiac facilities in it as well as a surgical tower, long overdue uh, uh, for things like that in this, uh, this part of the world. Um, we're also going to be looking at, at building seniors uh, um, uh, um, care homes. Uh, ensuring that every senior, if they want one, have a single room uh, to look after themselves and, and, and have the care that they need. We're going to provide uh, up to a $7,000 tax rebate for uh, seniors to ensure that they, you know, whatever care that they need, uh, uh, they can get. And it'll be, uh, um, they'll be able to get that $7,000 tax credit uh, up to, and spend up to $20,000 on repairs and whatnot for their home in order to ensure that they're living in their home as, as long as they can. Uh, that's the best place for seniors. Uh, and then from there into a, a care home that's... Uh, you know, single rooms and whatnot. So we have a lot of plans for health in this part of the world. All right, and finally, Ms. Kendall. Um, yeah, so the healthcare model that um, exists presently is being stretched by COVID. Um, this is a, an opportunity for all of us to recognize where the gaps are in our service, making sure that we have the staff um, required. So making sure that the students that are graduating are in place, um, bringing in other um, resources of people that are available. I know that we've been pulling um, retired uh, retirees, doctors and nurses back on staff so that we could manage this crisis. Um, the Greens are also looking into the future and looking at a prevention model. How is it that we actually manage um, our health in a preventative way, making sure that students in schools have proper nutrition, making sure that health care with mental health and so on is looked after one in three people that are calling into the crisis line um, are not able to access services, so making sure that the mental health services are available. 
All right, thank you guys very much. That reaches our halfway point, so we're going to step away for a quick break. Thank you for staying with us, and we'll be back in a few moments. The BC Resources Coalition, proudly sponsoring the 2020 Candidates Forum, preserving our jobs, our future, our environment. Learn more at the bcrc.ca. We now return to the 2020 Candidates Forum, proudly sponsored by the BC Resources Coalition, preserving our jobs, our future, our environment. Learn more at the bcrc.ca. The 2020 Candidates Forum on CKPG is presented by the Prince George Chamber of Commerce. Engage, connect, enhance. Find out what the Chamber can do for you. Welcome back and thank you for staying tuned in to the 2020 All Candidates Forum for our provincial election coming up on October 24th. We're dealing with the Prince George Mackenzie candidates currently and we're moving into our second half of the questions. This first question has to do with connectivity and it will go to Ms. Kranz first. COVID-19 has exposed numerous challenges in rural and remote BC as it pertains to connectivity for businesses and healthcare. Knowing that these issues will continue for some time, what would your government do to increase access and availability to broadband internet and telehealth options? Um, well, I don't agree with you because I do not believe that it's going to last um, because I think that people are starting to see the reality. They're starting to see that, um, uh, that, uh, that we have an influenza that has actually decreased to non-existent numbers but we have this COVID-9 that's never been actually identified, purified, or isolated, and yet we're doing tests on it. So um, I think that, that the government is getting pushback. The WHO just announced that um, uh, they, do are, they are not recommending lockdowns for the country, and that is because they've been sued, they are being sued by four international um, uh, groups of people. Um, the provincial government and the uh, Ontario government are also being sued by constitutional lawyer Rocco Galetti and Bill 19 is um, also being challenged. So I think we're going to see some changes. All right, we'll move on to Mr. Morris. Yeah, out of the world of Zoom, I think a lot of us have been spending a lot of our time in front of a camera and a TV set uh, for the last uh, number of months here. Um, good to see that uh, Shaw Cable is uh, adding uh, fiber optic all along Highway 97 North up into Dawson Creek. Uh, to provide that redundancy that was so badly needed for this particular area here. Uh, you know, we do have, uh, um, you know, we partnered with TELUS uh, when we were still in government to ensure that we had cellular coverage along our highways uh, in British Columbia, and that's improving uh, on a regular basis uh, right across the north here. Um, I have made inquiries with TELUS to uh, find out what we would be looking at for cost to uh, provide uh, that kind of service into Mackenzie. Um, with fiber optic into Mackenzie and uh, the, the dollars don't seem that astronomical for us. So that's something I'd be tracking down once, uh, once we get to that uh, particular point. But uh, it, it's a fact of life, uh, you know, fiber optics and uh, cellular coverage now is a necessity in life. Ms. Kendall? Um, connectivity is a luxury in city centres and um, living in the north and rural areas we certainly have um, gaps in service and so making sure that our remote rural and remote communities have that type of service available whether it be telehealth or just broadband internet is, um, is, is really a service that we need to push for. It would allow our community members to reach out, um, get the information, the health information that they need. If there's a crisis, they could manage it potentially in their community if the skills and resources are available. Um, this is an opportunity to be able to provide any of the services into our most remote corners of the province. Um, I feel that it's necessary absolutely right across the province. And Ms. Atkinson. Thank you. Certainly COVID-19 has highlighted the need for um, high-speed internet across the entire province. I've uh, talked to mothers in my community that um, in the springtime where when kids were home from school, you actually had to pick and choose who got to learn that day because you couldn't have two people on the computer at the same time. And as um, Mike mentioned, uh, there are fiber optic cables heading north right now, not coming into the community of Mackenzie, but uh, Premier Horgan has assured me that that will happen. And I am, I'm also very happy to see that cell service along uh, Highway 16, the Highway of Tears, 
that issue has been addressed because at the end of the day, people's safety has to be uh, number one to all of us. All right, we'll move on to our next question related to tourism. Mr. Morris, this will go to you first. The industry, especially retail and restaurant businesses, has been hit particularly hard during the pandemic. How does your government plan to assist the ailing tourism industry? Yeah, we've already mentioned that we're providing uh, um, bridge financing for a lot of the companies that are suffering and, and won't be able to make it through the, through the winter months. Uh, so we'll be providing some assistance for them so that they're, they're a viable business once tourism commences again uh, in the spring. And with the massive infrastructure project or programs that we plan on uh, implementing right across the province here, uh, right up into the north, um, people will be working. And if people are working, they're going to be spending their money on tourism in the restaurants uh, and, and the bars and the clubs that we have around the province here. So uh, the other aspect we're going to look at is uh, a regionalization, uh, look at, at um, how we uh, open and how we treat businesses in northern BC versus the highly populated areas of the south. Uh, I don't think we need to have the same response province-wide. Ms. Kendall? Um, yep, so the BC Greens are looking at definitely providing some funding um, in the source of direct access and um, grants to small and medium businesses in the tourism sector. I think the more important piece is what does our future look like in the tourism sector and making sure that um, br beautiful British Columbia remains beautiful. Um, we need to make a take a look at um, the old growth forest sector and whether or not we're actually going to be able to keep those sections aside so that ec ecosystems stay intact, um, making sure that our waters stay clean and that um, individuals that are tra traveling across the province can actually see behind um, corridors that have clear cuts behind them and how it is that we manage those so that, um, like I said, beautiful British Columbia stays beautiful. And Ms. Atkinson. Thank you. Uh, I certainly think the recent announcement of the Health Care Access Program is going to go a long way to re-employ many of the people who were displaced uh, in the tourism sector as a result of COVID-19. This program requires um, a great 10 education and uh, on the job training, you will be paid when you're being trained, you will be uh, given good onboarding. So this is going to help not only the health sector, but it's also going to help those unemployed people who work in the tourism industry, both are uh, service provider work, so certainly the um, health care access program is going to go a long way, the 7,000 people that will be hired to help those unemployed tourism um, people. All right, our next question deals with, or oh, sorry, Ms. Krenz, you have one more answer for that one. Uh, yeah. Um, we, we, um, we, we feel that the lockdowns need to be ended and we need to have the real science as to uh, why people are required to wear masks. I think it's absolutely ludicrous when you walk into a restaurant and you're required to wear a mask until you get to the seat, then when you can remove the mask. I mean, I, mean, I, I nursed all the way through the H1N1 SARS and that. This just does not, this is not logical. This is not right. And most people know, but they're being censored. So end the lockdowns, get rid of the masks. The masks, boxes of masks, actually say not for medical or clinical use. People, start using your brain. Start questioning what's going on. End the lockdown, bring in the tourists, open the parks. I'm all for that. All right, we'll now move on to our next question. My apologies for that. Um, question seven, Ms. Kendall, we'll start with you, and it has to do with getting youth working. If your party is to be elected, would there be a comprehensive youth entrepreneurship strategy introduced? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, our, youth is our, the, our youth is our future. Um, making sure that our youth at school age, all throughout school, have opportunities to learn about new jobs, job placements, um, going into colleges, making sure that there's funding available, grants accessible, um, including our marginalized youth, um, youth in care networks specifically for them so that they can walk into a dorm, get those services provided to them so that someone's actually walking them through the process. Um, marginalized youth, same, making sure that they actually have those steps in place so that they're able to be um, served and not falling through the cracks. Um, the entrepreneurship for our youth, um, as I mentioned in forestry, making sure that high school students and colleges provide those services that allow youth to understand what it is in our industries that um, they may be interested to pursue. 
and support them. Okay, on to Ms. Atkinson. Thank you. Uh, I certainly agree with uh, Catherine that um, in investment in our, our youth uh, is something that we must do. It um, will guarantee their future and ours. I think there has to be more opportunities for youth to, to be able to experience um, work so that they can make uh, wise, solid decisions. And I certainly would um, support a youth entrepreneurship program. We have to be providing our youth with the tools. It's very evident in today's climate with COVID-19 and the stresses that youth face. Um, mental health issues have skyrocketed. So I think we have to be working hard to provide the services that are going to allow our youth to become healthy, productive people in society when they become adults. Ms. Kranz? Um, we believe in um, uh, training programs, apprenticeships. We believe in college and, um, and uh, the universities. Um, we believe that uh, university is not for everyone. We believe that um, apprenticeships should uh, start in the high school levels. And we believe that um, the university should um, start having the classrooms back, bringing the kids, as I, as I said before, that uh, we believe that the lockdown should end and let's get back to doing life. Thank you. And Mr. Morris. Uh, you know, we'll carry on with some of the programs that we'd implemented uh, when we were in government before. Uh, high school students uh, um, partaking in many of the different trades programs at the colleges uh, right across the province here, uh, picking up carpentry or, or metalworking or welding skills. Uh, oftentimes, uh, by the time they finish high school, they're very close to becoming a, a, a certified tradesperson as well. And I, I look at programs like Local Guide Outfitter has uh, introduced an apprenticeship program to train uh, First Nations youth on, on outdoor tourism. And uh, that's uh, been an excellent program, a, a big take up in, for the Takla Band. And I hope to see other uh, um, guide outfitters and every, uh, other people involved in outdoor tourism uh, partake in something like that as well. So every opportunity that we can engage our youth in, in the trades or in any kind of, a, uh, of an industry uh, or, or business sector, I think we should be taking that advantage. Okay, we'll now move on to our final question of the night, Ms. Atkinson. This one starts with you and it pertains to child care. Would your government improve access to child care by introducing measures to strengthen private and nonprofit options while using public options to fill the gaps? I, th I certainly think there, are, there is room for both. Um, child care spaces are at a premium in most communities and that um, prevents people from entering the workforce. So I think um, there is room for both, both private and public, but um, the thing that has to always happen is um, licensing is required so that we uh, can be confident and parents can be confident when they're sending their children to a daycare that they're going to be well taken care of, well provided and safe at all times. So I certainly think there, are room, there is room for both private and public daycare. Ms. Kranz? Um, I can't argue with that. We believe in uh, both the private and uh, the public uh, daycare facilities and um, preschool. Yeah, it's all good. Mr. Morris? Yeah, we uh, see that the, there's a real need for people to get up and working uh, with the infrastructure program that we're going to be bringing into play. Uh, there's going to be a need for workers right across this province and uh, one of the most significant impediments for young couples is child care support. So we'll be introducing a $10 a day child care for those families making under $65,000 a year, uh, $20 and it'll be progressively increased up to $30 uh, a day for, uh, for depending on what your, um, your, your income is. But it's imperative and we will be building the uh, spaces that we need, uh, you know, putting the infrastructure in place uh, to house as many as we need to get parents up and working. And finally, Ms. Kendall. Um, so the BC Greens have a very uh, family-centered approach to childcare, making sure that parents or families that have children under the age of three, that childcare is at no cost. Uh, making sure that families ha that have children that need to access daycare have the opportunity to stay at home and be supported if they so choose. 
Um, again, I mentioned the four-day work week, so that is family-centered, making sure that people have more time with their family. And again, right across the board in the province, making sure that there are more child care spaces for all ages under school age to make sure that um, kids have the, the um, opportunity to have child care and their families knowing that those child cares are looked after. Um, as far as supports and making sure that our ECE students are qualified and look after those children while they're in there. All right, thank you very much. Thank you guys all for your answers. Uh, we'll move now to the final item of the night, which is your closing statement. Uh, Ms. Atkinson, we'll start with you. You have two minutes. Thanks very much. Um, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to speak this evening. I, I want to start off by saying I've never been a, a strong partisan supporter. I've always voted for the party and the leader that I think is doing the best job at that time, and, and that um, clearly is John Horgan. I, I want to... Um, remind everyone of the support that we have already received from the BCNDP, particularly in the north. So last year, the BCNDP introduced the Northern Capital Planning Grant, and they dispersed um, $100 million from Haida Gwaii to Valmont. And then this year, they dispersed an additional $50 million from Haida Gwaii to Valmont. So within the regional district of Fraser Fort George and the communities of Prince George, Valmont, Mackenzie and McBride, um, there was more than $30 million dispersed to help with infrastructure because the in NDP government realized that small communities without big tax bases struggle to, to take care of infrastructure. I, um, I look forward to going to Victoria and, and being the MLA for Prince George Mackenzie. As I said, uh, I, um, I at the end of the day, I think we all have to work collectively, regardless of what side of the house you sit on. We have to be working in the best interests of the citizens of this beautiful province, and we have to be listening to their concerns. And I will do that for all of you. I will be that strong voice. So on October the 24th, vote Joan Atkinson. Thank you. On to Ms. Kendall. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you again. I am honored to be in the seat. Um, I'm a mother of six and I'm here um, for my children's future. Um, my nine-year-old child um, created a film this year with a youth program that we provided virtual and it was about how he was impacted by COVID and having to stay home. And it was really all about um, how it is that we could all look after Mother Earth. It was a very beautiful and poignant film by a nine-year-old. Um, I think it's really important that we embrace our environment that uh, nurtures us. We look after our air, our water, and our natural environment so that um, it can carry us on to the future and that future generations have an opportunity to see beautiful BC for what it is today. Um, we can no longer go with what we've done yesterday in our politics. Um, we've provided a top-down approach where way too many gaps in service um, have um, created a, a host of um, opportunities for our most vulnerable community members to just be left to the wayside. We have um, way too many homeless people. Gang prevention is going up. We have an opioid crisis that far outweighs the COVID crisis that we have going on today that never nearly makes it to the news in the front and center. Um, and these are important gaps that we need to serve. Um, the work that I've done for the last 20 years has been about filling those gaps in the social service sector. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my opening statement, that our nonprofit sector in this province um, can make a lot of change happen with not a lot of dollars. And I think we really need to focus on this type of model because with those extra dollars, we can do a lot of excellent work. I don't think it's about hiring more police officers to heavy-handedly place more youth down onto the street. It's about reaching out to those youth and those families and bringing them home or providing those services that allow them to have a really good meal, um, some great exercise, and a fun time. All right, on to Mr. Morris. Yeah, the, the, you know, with the downturn in the, in the force sector uh, by the uh, lack of fiber, um, we've seen some significant reductions there. We have to look... Uh, far and wide uh, to see what we can do to diversify the resource sector in British Columbia. Uh, this, is, this is one of the, the, the main supports for the British Columbian economy is the resource sector. Uh, we've relied on forestry now for well over 100 years, but there's other opportunities that we have in British Columbia here with the uh, petrochemical industry that we don't have yet in British Columbia. The, we have some of the richest liquids, natural gas in the Peace River area um, that we can take advantage of. 
We've got uh, some of the richest gold deposits and mineral deposits between the coast range and the Rocky Mountains from here up into the Yukon that uh, uh, we need to have a look at. We have precious metals that are so vital in today's modern technology that we should be taking advantage of as well. So there are numerous opportunities that we can look at uh, in the central interior in British Columbia here to drive our economy forward to make sure that everybody has a job uh, for the families that they support and, and uh, uh, for, for the wellness of everybody to make sure that uh, we have a happy or a healthy uh, economic uh, um, situation here in British Columbia for everybody. And finally on to Ms. Krantz. I'm here today because I have been very unhappy with um, the representation that I've seen in uh, the provincial government and the federal government. And um, these are really great people and they speak really well. But if your party does not allow you to say anything other than what, what their mandate is, then it's irrelevant. And the difference between that and the Christian Heritage Party is that I am allowed to take the concerns of my constituency to the legislature and speak and vote according to our needs and desires. We, we actually have a voice. And we stand for life, we stand for family, and we stand for freedom. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Uh, thank you for your preparation for tonight and your care um, and honesty about the issues that we face here in Northern BC. Um, we appreciate your guys' time. And now the job turns over to the voters. Thank you for tuning in and for getting a little bit more informed about the Prince George Mackenzie riding and what your different candidates are vying for. On or before October 24th, Please vote, exercise your democratic right, and join us once the polls close for all the live coverage pertaining to BC's election. Thanks again for joining us. The BC Resources Coalition, proudly sponsoring the 2020 Candidates Forum. Preserving our jobs, our future, our environment. Learn more at thebcrc.ca. The 2020 Candidates Forum on CKPG is presented by the Prince George Chamber of Commerce. Engage, connect, enhance. Find out what the Chamber can do for you.